I was at university and I read A Good Man in Africa. I think uh, I reread it when I was lucky enough to uh, start working with you. And I have to say, I think it's probably one of the best debut novels I've ever read. And so if you haven't read it, read it. Because I think as a writer, it just has everything. It has the humour, it has the style, it has the plot. And also, um, it has the ambition, to s and it has a look back at some traditions, whether it's Evan and War or Graham Greene, I can ask him later what his uh, influences were. But I think it's a really stylish entry into a confident first novel, which is what Half the Battle is. So I'm going to start with that, and I'm going to ask you, how did that happen, and how did you get published in it? Well, actually, interesting enough, it was my fourth novel. Um, <laughs> so that's very funny. I had written, I had written three novels before uh, Good Man in Africa was published. Um, and uh, in those days, um, rather like you, I wanted to be a novelist, but I had no idea how you went about it. I didn't come from a literary background. I didn't know any writers. Um, I was studying English literature at university in Scotland. Um, and uh, you, it was a process of self-education. There were no, no courses like this. There were no creative writing courses then. So um, I, I learned by a kind of self-imposed apprenticeship. I, I just wrote novels and found out how to, how to do it. Uh, the first novel I wrote, um, they're all in bottom drawers, um, was called uh, Is That All There Is? Um, <laughs> totally not. Which is from a Peggy Lee song, in fact, um, which was the thinly disguised autobiographical novel um, you are the most fascinating person on the planet, the rest of the world deserves to know all about you. I got it out of my system, <laughs> put it away. Um, I then wrote a very experimental novel, because I was studying English literature, and uh, uh, by then I'd moved to Oxford, which was doing a PhD, and uh, uh, I wrote a very experimental novel about a period of my life, which was when I was uh, living in Nigeria as a teenager during the Nigerian Civil War. And I wrote a novel called Against the Day, which is a kind of collage novel. Um, newspaper reports, diary entries, free associating monologues, etc., etc. Un un unreadable. Um, <laughs> and I, I gave it to, by then I was publishing a few short stories, and I gave it to the editor of this magazine, a very interesting man who was, in a way, a kind of mentor to me, though he would hate to be called that, a man called Alan Ross. And Alan uh, quite, quite liked against the day and uh, um, but sort of said you know you know don't give up the day job um, which uh, and so I then wrote another novel because um, I was getting a bit desperate at this stage um, short stories being published um, or broadcast on the BBC but the first two novels not quite clicking and I then wrote a kind of comic thriller um, which I thought well I'm, I'll go more commercial in the way you think you're just desperate to be published um, and I wrote a comic thriller called True Love at 29. Uh, but True Love is the, the person's name, actually. It's called Neil True Love. Um, uh, and it's by a poet, and he gets embroiled in a kind of drug scam and so on. Um, but that, by that, this time, events had caught up with me. I'd published about nine or ten short stories in little magazines. And again, in those days, though maybe coming back, you were saying, Joey, people are publishing short stories again. Um, there were a lot of short story collections being being published, and so I, I thought, well, maybe I'll have better luck with my short stories than, than my novels. Uh, and so I, I sent um, the collection of short stories, I made copies of them both, here's a tip. Um, uh, I <laughs> made copies of them both, and I sent them simultaneously to the managing director of Hamish Hamilton and Jonathan Cape, both of whom published short stories. I went to the man at the top, uh, and, uh, and I said as a PS, I've written a novel featuring a character who appears in two of these short stories that had been published in, in magazines. The <coughs> Jonathan Cape never replied, um, and I spoke to the then managing director, Tom Mashler, and I said, you know, you never replied to me, Tom. And uh, he said, nonsense, nonsense, uh, I always reply. Uh, but he didn't. But the, 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 edit, the managing director of Hamish Hamilton did reply, Christopher Sinclair Stevenson. And he said, I really like your short stories, but the market being such as it is, I'd rather publish your novel first, featuring this overweight, drunken English diplomat. Um, and there I was in a real dilemma because I hadn't written the novel. 
I'd lied. Um, and and uh, I said, but you know, it's a great day, you know, um, <laughs> two book deal. Um, but, uh, but, I, uh, but I hadn't written the, I hadn't written the, the novel. So I, I, I carried on lying and I said, you know, the manuscript's in a shocking state. I need to rewrite it and retype it. And so I, the, the novel was in my head and I, so I, I, I sat down and I wrote The Good Man in Africa in a kind of white heat of, uh, I don't know, fear maybe, um, and, uh, and gave it to Christopher St. Clair Stevenson and it was published a year later. Um, and then three years later I told him that I'd lied and he's, he forgave me. But um, it was a, it's an interesting story because the book was very successful. Um, it's still in print you know, 33 years later. Um, and it sold, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies, and it won two prizes, and uh, I was picked up by Penguin, and it looked like a kind of overnight sensational success, but actually, you know, it was my fourth novel.